hi there, Jeffrey. Well, congratulations on Boulevard of Hollywood Story. Thank you. I'm happy to be talking to you again. I've known you for, for a while now and time yeah. too. And tend to run into each other at Outfest. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. In person, I am assuming this year. Y yes. <laughs> and assume, um, in person with the, with the virtual element too for, for folks who, who can't be there. So it's uh, all bases covered. <laughs> yes. So um, yes. let's just find out when you first encountered the film Sunset Boulevard, if you remember sort of when that was and what your first impressions of, of the film were. Uh, to be honest, my first uh, encounter with Sunset Boulevard was through the parody that Carol Burnett used to do on the Carol Burnett show. She used to do basically a takeoff of Norman Desmond, who's this just insane silent movie caricature, completely over the top takeoff of Norman Desmond. And I don't know if you ever saw that. Did you ever see the uh, um, Carol Burnett do Norman Desmond on her show in the 70s? I don't think so. No, I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> you should watch it. So it, that's how I knew it. Sort of like a lot of movies that when we were kids we couldn't see so we would read the, the mad magazine parodies first like that's how i got to know like clark orange and network and a lot of these like grown-up movies anyway seeing carol burnett do her and then i caught up to the movie probably in high school or college and i always say like it's interesting that sometimes our taste in movies come out before we do <laughs> and i was really drawn to sunset boulevard whatever happened to baby jane you know obviously movies with bigger than life female characters, kind of damaged female characters, which for whatever reason, a lot of us are drawn to, you know? So I love Sunset Boulevard and started studying Sunset Boulevard when I was in school and getting to know some of the backstory of the film, getting to know, uh, I kind of just assumed that Gloria Swanson, the star of the movie was that character because it was so indelible. And a lot of the things in the movie are pulled from her life as I found out later. Um, but in fact, she was nothing like that character on the screen. And so, uh, but it's just a movie that I keep going back to over and over. I never get tired of it. I could watch it. I could watch it all the time. I watch it all the time still and never get tired of it. Yeah, because um, I mean, for one thing, Gloria Swanson had been a silent um, movie star and then had transitioned to the talkies like Norma Desmond. And that's, that's just one thing that I think people make the link and think, oh, it must kind of be based on her. <laughs> Yeah, she she did make the jump. She she started very early. She, her her life kind of spans of the, the history of cinema, because when she was still a teenager, she started acting acting in these one reelers. She had no acting experience at all. She was actually just visiting a set in Chicago with her aunt, and somebody on the set spotted her and said, "Hey, do you want to be in the movie?" And that's how it started. She had zero training, so she learned by doing. And she started off in these like one reelers. They used to call them little comedy shorts. And then slowly she started you know, getting bigger and bigger parts and graduated to what were eventually feature films. And she connected with Cecil B. DeMille and Cecil B. DeMille was really the, the director that made her a star and started putting her in these kind of marriage dramas that are really a little tough to get through today if you could find them. Like there was one called Don't Change Your Husband and Why Change Your Wife and things like that. There are sort of these like drawing room movies but she always would wear these amazing outfits and that was probably a lot of the reason why people went to see her movies is to see what she was going to wear, particularly women. So, you know, they, uh, Cecil B. DeMille and her developed this sort of scream persona of Gloria as uh, almost like a clothes horse. You know, that's what they would call her. It's a horrible word, but a clothes horse. But she would be there to, to demonstrate the latest fashions. So, again, her career continued. Uh, when uh, talkies came in, a lot of stars from the silent era tried to make that transition. Most of them didn't make it. Garbo was one of the exceptions. And Gloria Swanson did make a few uh, talkies into the 30, 20s, into the uh, 30s, uh, even into the 40s. But she never was able to make that transition, really. She didn't maintain that stardom as a movie star into the talk, talking era, but she maintained her status as a celebrity. So the, she started to play the character of herself in a way. So into the 40s and into the 50s, before Sunset Boulevard even, she was not forgotten. She was still very much a known entity. She had her own clothes line. She had a makeup line. She even had a, um, a TV show, an afternoon TV show, sort of like um, where she'd be sort of like an early Martha Stewart, where she'd be on and talking to socialites and making, uh, you know, cooking food on camera. And it was really, really crude. And not a lot of those shows still uh, survive. But she was on the cover of the first issue of TV Guide if you can find it, which is in our film. So, so she was a celebrity and she uh, definitely was one of the um, stars that was able to maintain the stardom, but in a different way. 
And when did you and how did you come across the story that she tried to make uh, Sunset Boulevard into a musical? And why did you think that might be a good you know, subject for, for the documentary? Yeah, she, um, I didn't know anything about this. I knew about the musical version of Sunset Boulevard that Andrew Lloyd Webber did in the early 90s with Glenn Close, which has just been revived and they're talking about making that into a movie now. So that I certainly knew about, but I didn't know about her, Gloria Swanson's attempts to do, to do this not that long after Sunset Boulevard came out. This was like maybe three, four, five years later where she had the idea to do this. And there's a book I read uh, by Sam Staggs called Close Up on Sunset Boulevard, which is this great uh, making of Sunset Boulevard, mostly focusing on the movie. And, he, and Sam's written a bunch of books that I'm sure your audience, if they don't already know, they should definitely read them because he's written books about imitation of life and truth, turn and desire and all about Eve. And so his book on Sunset Boulevard had one chapter about this musical. It was maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 pages. And I, as soon as I read that, I was like, oh my God, how come I never heard about this? And this is a movie because it had all the elements of a great drama. You know, it had Gloria Swanson who after Sunset Boulevard, it was a huge success, a big hit. It put her back into the public's uh, mind again. And she was again, a movie star, but there was no follow-up to that. You know, after Sunset Boulevard, nobody was offering her any other roles. And I wonder why that is like she was over 50. And so the problems that a lot of actresses face today of being over a certain age and there's just less parts for those people. So she, and she lost the Oscar. She was up for the Oscar and she didn't win. It was, it was a competitive really no year though, wasn't it? As you show in the film, like the lineup of um, actresses for, for the, that year at the Oscars was yeah, pretty tough competition. Yeah, she was against, she was up against uh, Betty Davis for All About Eve and I don't want to give too much away because no. it's in the movie, but, but anyway, there was a, a whole story. So she lost that Oscar. And so um, she, anyway, so I read this chapter in the book and, and what really interested me was her collaborators and her two collaborators on this idea she had were these two men who no one's really ever heard of, uh, Dixon Hughes and Richard Stapley. And they were songwriting partners. Richard had been, Richard was a very, very handsome British uh, actor. He had a, a career as an actor. He was a little bit of a known quantity for about five minutes. He did a few movies and some big movies in, at MGM, like The Three Musketeers and Little Women, but small, small roles. He never really made much of an impression. So when he connected with Dixon, his boyfriend at the time, they, Dixon was a composer and a lyricist and played piano at, at cocktail bars and things like that. They connected, they, were, they became boyfriends and they had an idea to do a, a musical review and they were looking for a star. So they somehow found their way to Gloria Swanson and she did not want to do their musical review, but she told them I would do, I would go back to Broadway if somebody could create a musical version of Sunset Boulevard. And of course these two guys are young, ambitious, and needed a job, <laughs> you know, much like the character in Sunset Boulevard <laughs> that William Holden plays. And so the three of them started to work on this. And so that, a little bit of that story was told in this one chapter. And, uh, but I didn't know, I mean, the two men are no longer alive. Gloria's long gone. But I had no idea if the story could even be told because what materials remained of this story. So just started, um, digging around and one of the men who was interviewed for this uh, chapter in the book is named Alan Eichler, who, and Alan is someone I know uh, socially and he um, was friends with both Dixon and Richard. And I called Alan and I said, I'd love to know more about this. And he said, first thing he said to me was, I've been waiting for 25 years for somebody to call me about this because this is an incredible story and it needs to be told, right? So, that's when uh, the wheel started turning and then one thing led to another and I started discovering interviews with the two men. So I found a very extended audio interview with Dixon Hughes and I found an extended video interview with Richard Stapley. And that's when I realized that it would be possible to make this film because these sort of primary documents existed. And then other people could sort of come in and be the, the chorus to tell the rest of the story. And you mentioned that call and as a filmmaker, you don't generally tend to put yourself into the film, um, into your films as a character. And you, you do in this film, um, almost like as, you know, a documentary detective <laughs> at, at the beginning. I just wondered why you, you wanted to take that approach uh, you know, with this film. Um, well, it's the first time I've ever done that and probably the last because it just felt appropriate for this movie. And that was not the intention going in at the beginning. But I think if you talk to any documentary filmmakers, we're all detectives and we're all archeologists. 
And particularly with a story like this, which is really not been told to the extent that it's been told in this, you really are, um, are telling a story for the, in a way for the first time. So that's what really excited me about this. My other films, the stories of the people that I've profiled in those films, so in, in one degree or another, a lot of that story had been told, like there have been bi written biographies about, about Divine and Jack Wrangler wrote his autobiography. But in this one, like there's really, we're kind of starting from scratch in a way. So in terms of putting myself in it and people will see when they see the movie, I'm, I'm in it, but it's not like, I'm not like a Michael Moore who it, the story is really centered around, but I am there as sort of a facilitator and I thought it would be very really interesting. And this was not the intention at the beginning. This came in like while we were in editing and I had a couple of collaborators say to me like, have you thought about like including yourself in the movie and including the search for the materials? Um, because as documentarians, a lot of times we go to the archives and when we find something in the archives, like we're jumping for joy that we found this thing that we, we are gonna use to be able to tell the story. Um, and so I was so happy to discover that Gloria Swanson herself left her entire life's worth of archives to the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. She saved everything, everything from the beginning to the day she died. And she had file folders on the musical and she had, they had recorded test recordings of all the songs for the musical and they're all there sitting in the archive. So they've been incredible. The archive, they've basically opened up the vault and I've also been working with Gloria's estate and her, her granddaughter, Brooke Anderson, who's in the film, and, you know, they, Brooke is very happy that her grandmother's name is being spoken again. It's not like her grandmother was ever forgotten, but if people do know about Gloria Swanson, they just have this impression of her from Sunset Boulevard and they think that's her. And so Brooke, you know, she was invested in making sure people knew the real story of her mother and not the, the, the character she played. Yeah. But I think you illustrate really well that were it not for this film, then, uh, the interview with Richard Stapley, for instance, might just remain on that videotape in that cardboard box in the attic. And, you know, similarly, these um, audio recordings that you mentioned of the songs, you know, might not be heard. Yeah, I mean, with so many docs, you know, unless somebody takes an interest and says, um, you know, I think there's something here. These stories, how many stories are there that are buried in boxes and sitting in people's attics and in basements? They're particularly queer stories. You know, another thing that attracted me to this was these these two men that, you know, were not famous in their lifetimes. You know, Richard had a moment where he was a, a movie star, but they were working artists. You know, they were strug they struggled, they had some successes, they had some failures, and then then now they're gone. You know, and they never. You know, they presented themselves to the world as songwriting partners. You certainly couldn't present yourself to the world in the 50s as a couple, right? So part of what I love about making documentaries and seeing docs by other people about our history, like there was one, um, P.S. Burn This Letter that came out last year. I mean, oh my God, that movie just sent me to the moon, you know, it was so great because all this stuff would just be sitting in boxes and we were never able to tell our own stories. And a lot of times when queer people pass away, the relatives don't value their, their archives or value their stories. And a lot of the stuff gets tossed in the garbage. That's what happened to Richard's papers. You know, when Richard died, most of his writings, most of his photos, just gone, you know? So we had to piece things together from what was left behind, a little that was left behind from these two guys. Yeah, in terms of people maybe not publicly identifying um, as being a couple like Richard and Dixon, um, probably were, you know, um, you mentioned in the film that uh, Gloria would, would have known exactly uh, their relationship, but what are the kind of challenges there of sort of piecing that together and um, what sort of allowed you to kind of, I guess, demonstrate, you know, that they're boyfriends. I mean, people will see in the film, but if you give us an idea of that. Yeah, well, you know, I did find these two interviews with the men and there are people that knew them in their lifetimes who spoke very openly and candidly about it. And Dixon, um, did revisit this material in the 90s. Dixon wrote a sort of a cabaret act based on his experiences with Richard and Gloria, which we talk about in the film. And he did talk about openly about, about being Richard's boyfriend, but in, if he were to do it today, it would be much more explicit. You know, it was very, it was still a little bit coded, you know? I mean, it was clear that they were, that they were had been boyfriends. Richard Stapley, you know, he was not somebody who was gonna talk about this in his lifetime. As he got older, he did write uh, or attempt to write an autobiography where he did start to talk about this stuff. And so they did get more and more comfortable as they got older and the world changed where they could talk about it. But 
with people of that generation, it never goes away, you know? And um, I remember interviewing Tab Hunter for a film I made about his life, the, the film star Tab Hunter. And even into his seventies and eighties, he was, he was ready to talk about it, but there was still like an intense discomfort <laughs> about this because yeah. it was a matter of survival to keep that close to the best. So we're obviously talking over Zoom now and we've all got quite used to, to doing these kind of conversations. But so you actually use Zoom for um, some of your research on the film and I included some of the footage in the film. Um, so that maybe leads us to talking to you about like how um, the pandemic maybe affected your usual kind of filmmaking process. Well, definitely affected us all, you know, over the past year and a half while we were in lockdown, I work out of my house anyway. So for, personally, I've been very fortunate because I could keep the projects going and Boulevard was already in post-production uh, when the pandemic hit. So I was editing, but um, we still needed, a, actually I was planning to go do a shoot at the uh, uh, Harry Ransom Center in April of was it last year, no, 19, oh my God. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, we were planning to go to Austin to film me in the archives, looking through the material and talking to the head of the archive, but that got canceled. That was not gonna be possible. And so instead, you know, we just had to find ways around that. So one of the ways around that was to interview people over Zoom. And that seemed to work actually, you know, and, and we thought, well, maybe we can incorporate this somehow into the film. You're gonna be seeing a lot of that. Uh, a lot of filmmakers have been doing that, you know, Alex Gibney and his film about COVID uh, did, did interviews over Zoom or they would like, we have a, a, an entire camera rig on a, on a cart and they would leave it outside the person's house. And then the person would like bring the cart in their house and set up the camera themselves. And it's, so we've all had to find ways to deal with this, you know, but um, in terms of uh, the past year, it definitely gave me a lot more time to focus on the film and to use those limitations of what could and couldn't be done out in the world and try to, to use it in a creative way and, and make it an asset to the film. And hopefully people aren't so sick of looking at Zooms that you know, when they see it pop up in the movie, uh, they don't you know, get uh, a PTSD from- No, I don't think so, but you also have a little, you have a little bit of fun with the like, can you, you, know, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, there was that, you know, there was, it's Zoom, but there's also, uh, there's a, I have a long Skype call in there too. And so, yeah. Um, it's, I thought it would be fun to kind of show a little bit of that and to show, you know, when people watch a doc, they're not really supposed to be thinking about how it all came together. They're just there to follow the story. And that is the intention with this film. I, I want people to be swept away by the story, but we just thought it'd be interesting to show a little bit about what it takes to make a doc and, and how you can, how you need to follow all these leads like a detective to, to get your story. Um, and in terms of seeing um, the parallels between Sunset Boulevard, you know, the, the, the plot of the film and what was happening between Gloria and um, Dixon and, and Richard, um, I like the inclusion of film clips from Sunset Boulevard. How much fun did you have sort of selecting what um, to pick and, you know, seeing those parallels, I guess? Yeah, I mean, the other uh, reason I thought this could make a, a, a fun film is that there were so many parallels between the plot of Sunset Boulevard, right? Uh, which is about an older woman and a younger man who she brings into her world to write a script for her. And then during the course of this creative partnership, she starts to develop feelings for him that are not necessarily recipro reciprocated, right? So in the story of Dixon and Richard and Gloria, during the course of, you know, she brings them into her world, she puts them on the payroll, and they're writing this a little bit of a folly, you know, like they all wanted it to happen, but you know, for various reasons, it never did. But during the course of the, the creative partnership, she started to develop some feelings for Richard and which were maybe or maybe not reciprocated. You'll see it in the movie. Um, so the parallels were definitely there. And I thought uh, it would be fun to play with that and, and show clips from the film that reflect the parallel sort of life imitating art situation in, in the doc. One of my favorites was, um... If things were getting queer or it was getting queer, but queerer things were yet to come. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a line William Holden has in, in uh, Sunset Boulevard, yes. L l listening to the songs, um, I have to say they kind of grew on me and there was, some, there, there was something there. What, what, what was your own sort of thoughts on the songs and if it could have been a success had it made it to Broadway? Well, we'll never know because it never did make it to Broadway. And in fact, Gloria never really had the rights to do it, you know, and you know, the songs are still there. I guess it's possible that maybe one day somebody could do it, but 
I don't know. I would leave that to others to decide whether the songs are of that level. It's not Rodgers and Hammerstein, I'll put it that way, you know, but they're very earnest and they're very sincere. There's a couple of songs I really like. They're the Wonderful People song, which is sort of a, a, a riff on Gloria's, I'm sorry, Norma Desmond's speech in the film about those wonderful people out there in the dark. Um, so they wrote a song called Wonderful People. There's a song called What's the Answer. There's some very nice songs, um, but they're more like piano bar songs. I don't know that they, um, I don't know that th there's not like one hit song in the thing, you know, in, in musicals of the 50s, that was the popular music of the time. And you would hear those songs on the radio, right? And people would cover them, you know, Frank Sinatra would cover songs from Broadway shows. There's not a song, at least in my opinion, there's not a song that rises to that level um, among this batch, but you know, who knows? I would love to hear other people's interpretation of these songs, like modern artists to sing yeah. some of the songs, we'll see, I don't know. I hope that this movie will lead to some interest in, in um, that, that body of songs. Cause they wrote like, I don't know how many, maybe 20 or 30 songs. And there's recordings of all of them. And I like your use of animation in the film, which you've used in your previous films too. Um, why did you think it would, you know, be suitable for this film, or would, would work well for this film? And um, tell me a little bit about deciding on the style, the kind of animation style that you use. Yeah, well, there's just a lot of sections in the film that don't. That there's just nothing to see, right? And I, I love interviews and. Um, I, I bristle a little bit when people call interviews talking heads because all movies are talking heads, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, but at the same time, you don't want to rely on that overlay as a visual, you know, you want to, you want to delight the audience as much as you can, right? And so I thought animation would be important for this. So we, we chose maybe 10 or 12 beats throughout the film that we could go into this animated world and who was going to be the right person to illustrate that immediately I, my mind went to a guy named Maurice Velikoop. And Maurice, um, if people uh, look him up and find his work, they'll see that he's been working consistently for decades. And he's one of the uh, queer comics. There's actually an, a new documentary in Outfest this year about queer comics called No Straight Lines. Um, I'm not sure if Maurice is in that actually, but Maurice is somebody, I've just loved his work for years. And he kind of specializes in um, bringing uh, queer, a queer point of view uh, in terms of pop culture into his work. So he's he's actually drawn all the big um, glamorous movie stars. He never really drew Gloria Swanson though. So I just reached out to him and, and ran this idea by him. And he immediately loved the idea and started sending me drawings of Gloria and Richard and Dixon. And I just started to get so excited about what the possibilities could be. Uh, and so he went, he really knocked it out of the park. He So he drew all of the the animation, he drew the illustrations for the animations and the company in Toronto called Reactor did the actual animation. And he also drew our poster. And so he really, as much as uh, anyone, really helped to define the, the visual personality of the film. Maurice Velikouk. Yeah, there's some really beautiful Japan. moments. I, I like the um, the gay bar moment when Richard goes out and you know, the moment yeah. between the three of them, yeah. Yes, and Maurice is so great. Like when he knew he was gonna draw a, a gay bar, he's like, what did the gay bar look like in the 50s? So he went to a movie called Advise and Consent, which was a probably one of the first, if not the first um, look inside of a gay bar in a Hollywood movie. So if you look at his drawings of the gay bar, you'll see some references to um, Advise and Consent. And then also there's a scene where this is the first time that the Richard and Dixon meet Gloria and Gloria sort of emerges, you know, dressed to the nines and her her dress in the drawing is the dress that Rosalind Russell wore in Anti-Mame. So there's all kind of little in-jokes and references for uh, for the audience in oh, his work. That's a beautiful detail. Yeah, love, um, love an Anti-Mame reference. <laughs> and so you were also editor on this film. You've edited a lot of your, your own films um, previously as well. How does that kind of affect you as a director? Are you already kind of kind of um, thinking forward to the editing process as you're make, making the film? Yeah, I, for sure. I mean, even in thinking about whether this story would translate to film, I mean, there's a lot of great stories, but they don't all necessarily, they won't necessarily, all necessarily work as a movie, but this one had all the elements because it had these different time periods and it had a progression of action and it had, you got to track what happened to each of the characters before, during, and especially after this whole incident, because the movie, you know, the, the writing of this musical is only a little, a small part of the film. A lot of the film tracks what happened to Dixon and Richard in, in their futures, and especially as they age. 
So yeah, I'm always editing, even when I'm sitting down doing an interview, I'm already editing in my head. So um, I edit sort of as we go. And, you know, along the way, I de definitely, uh, you lose perspective after a while and then you want to bring people in who can help you. So I had some, some brilliant uh, editors, associate editors, consulting editors, you know, people who came in and looked what I, looked what I had and can help to jar my thinking and sort of break my brain a little bit. Like uh, my friend Elijah was the one who suggested, oh, why don't you include yourself in the movie? And I had never even thought of that, you know, before. And so once he said that, it really changed the movie. Because this this one, um, there were a lot of different ways that the story could have been structured and told and holding back certain information until later in the film as a reveal, as opposed to revealing it right up front. So it went through many, many different versions. And my poor friends who had to suffer through um, test screenings of this can test. Uh, but we landed in a really, hopefully a good place. And um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I love to edit That's I started as an editor and my mentor in editing was a guy named Arnie Glassman. And I talk about him as often as I possibly can. He's no longer with us, but he edited the celluloid closet. And that was my first job working in documentaries, first official paid job. And I met Arnie there and kind of took me under his wing and the techniques that Arnie taught me about editing and especially editing interviews and archival materials and film clips and how to structure uh, a scene and a sequence and then an act and then a full movie, right? I got so much of that from him. So I, I miss him every day and I'm, I'm still stealing from him. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> we all need mentors like that, don't we? So yeah. For sure. And, and so many of your films have um, played out fest uh, over the years. And so I just wondered what it means to you for um, this particular film to be having its world premiere um, at Outfest this year. Yeah, um, I've been very lucky. I've made, this is my seventh movie and um, six of them have played at Outfest. And the seventh one was my first one and it was not a queer movie. So that's, that's why. But uh, they, they've been very, very supportive of me over the years. I'm very grateful. But this is the first premiere at Outfest. This is the first time that I have a movie that's gonna actually premiere. And we thought it would be perfect to premiere this film at Outfest because it's a Hollywood story. It's even in the title. Um, and we wanted to have a hometown premiere and where we're screening is the director's guild which is on sunset boulevard right right down the street from where schwab's drugstore used to be which is one of the scenes in sunset boulevard there's a few scenes set at schwab's drugstore which was a place where a lot of the the out of work actors um used to hang out back in the day so yeah i, I am thrilled about an outfest premiere and the fact that we're going to be doing this in person knock wood um i i can't tell you how thrilling that is uh, because i know how Mm, conflicted people were last year because yes, they were gonna have their world premiere or their premiere, but it wasn't gonna be in person. And you don't know how people are responding to your movie, right? So uh, we are gonna have a virtual component and I'm very happy for that for people who either can't get out or are choosing not to go out, but we'll have a, a, a Director's Guild screening and that is like one of the best screening uh, rooms in the city. So I'm very, very, very uh, thrilled about that, excited about that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, a brilliant place to, to watch a film and to have a screening and to have discussions afterwards as well. Um, so it's, it's going to be a, a great night. Uh, so just one um, final question for you, uh, Jeffrey, and it's probably quite a big one. What is your favorite piece of LGBTQ plus culture? So it could be a film, a book, a, a TV series, um, a musical, anything of choice, or a person, someone who identifies as LGBTQ plus, someone or something that's had, an, you know, made an impact on you and kind of resonated with you over the years. That's a great question. I mean, that, that's a hard one because there's so many. Um, I'm really very happy about Little Nas X right now. And I'm not really a consumer so much of like what's going on now. I'm much more drawn to stuff that happened in the past, but he is just um, knocking it out of the park. So I'm very excited by him. But I mean, when people ask me that, I always go back to the movie, The Boys in the Band and the play, The Boys in the Band, which I'm sure you know, um, it was a, a Broadway play uh, about a group of uh, gay friends and the, the the, the play, it was just remade. So probably a lot more people know about it. It was remade for Netflix, but um, I love the movie. And when I saw the movie, I was deep in the closet. I was still in high school. And um, every Saturday night there, there was a channel in New York called Channel 5 and they had the Channel 5 movie club. So every Saturday night at like 11 o'clock, somebody in the city could recommend a movie and then they would introduce the movie on camera. And somebody chose the boys in the band. 
And I didn't know what this was. And I watched it and I was like fascinated by it and also kind of like shocked by it and a little scared by it because the guys at first, you know, they're really having a great time and they're talking, they're, they're basically just being who they were. And there's so few examples of that. Even when I saw this, which was probably in the early eighties, so few examples of gay people just being themselves um, and not a caricature. Although that film was also accused of being a caricature. Anyway, I, I just was, uh, uh, kind of fascinated by that and uh, have revisited it over and over and over. And I probably watch it once a year. And so that's that's something that still inspires me because it's complicated. And, and the fact that at the time it came out, it was um, criticized by the gay liberation movement because it had been on Broadway before Stonewall. It kind of predicted Stonewall a little bit in the rage, the brewing simmering rage of gay people, right? Who had to, um, endure living this way and, and had to hide. And the anger and the rage that might come out of that, right? And the way we treat each other. And then um, Stonewall happens. And then that movie is suddenly considered like, you know, a stereotype mm -hmm. or um, almost like, I don't know if this is the correct way to put it, but like a minstrel show, you know? Like people thought it was something that should be buried. And mm -hmm. it's, I don't agree with that. And even now looking at the film, you wince at some of it, but you also love the characters and you and you love the world. So and it captures this moment in time. So that's a movie that uh, I keep going back to. Boys in the Van. And it's it's also rare like to have an entire film populated with LGBTQ characters. Yes, and also the fact that most of the cast were queer, but not necessarily out at the time. Although wait, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of them were out. Um, some of them were straight. A couple of them were straight but then it kind of put a big damper on their careers because at that time, if you were an actor and you played gay, you could get typecast whether you were gay or not, right? And most of the cast has passed away from AIDS. So there's a poignancy to the film watching it now that uh, if the more you know about the backstory of the film and the more you know about the actors, uh, I think the deeper an appreciation you can have. And the fact that they were, they, you know, the ones that were out at the time and associated themselves with this play. I thought this was an incredibly brave thing to do for them. And William Friedkin, who directed the movie, a straight guy who directed The Exorcist and French Connection, he directed this movie brilliantly and he pulled all the original cast from the Broadway show. So you get to see these performances preserved uh, for all time, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah, again, something that doesn't happen very often at all. So, well, Jeffrey Schwartz, thanks very much. Congratulations again on Boulevard, a Hollywood story. Thank you for um, being interested and for talking to me. I appreciate it. Speak again soon. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.